Hello, hello, Robert here. Robert from Plymouth in the UK. Hello. Hey, Robert. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Which part of the states are you from? I'm in Ohio. I'm in the southern part of Ohio, right, uh, right north of the Ohio River. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, you said that you're Unitarian. Perhaps you could tell me more. Yeah. Uh, I can't hear you. You've gone quiet. I can hear you now. Not sure what. Okay, I can. I can hear How about you now. now. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, thank you. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was raised Trinitarian. I, I was raised uh, Methodist, and I attended uh, Methodist churches and uh, Baptist churches. And uh, so for the first, I'm, I'm pushing 60. Um, and but for the first half of my life, uh, I was Trinitarian. And I became a biblical Unitarian based on studying scripture. Um, and, and the fact that the Bible teaches that our Heavenly Father is the only true God. And that his son, Jesus Christ, is the promised Messiah who came from the line of David. So that that caused me to reject what I was taught in Sunday school and in church, um, which was the Trinity doctrine, and to embrace um, a biblical um, uh, view of God and Jesus Christ. What was the Trinity doctrine that you rejected? Could you describe it to me, please? Uh, well, the, the Trinity, it, the, there's only one Trinity doctrine. It is basically that there um, is one God. He's only one being, but he uh, exists in, in the nature of uh, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And none of these three persons are the same, but they are all the one God. So there's two reasons uh, for me to reject the Trinity. And that is, number one, that the Son is not God. The Son is the Messiah. And the second reason for rejecting the Trinity is the fact that the Father and the Holy Spirit are not two different persons. You'll never hear anywhere in Scripture a conversation between the Father and the Holy Spirit because both terms simply refer to God. So the Father and the Holy Spirit aren't praying to each other or talking to each other or anything like that anywhere in Scripture. What you find is Jesus talking to God all, all throughout the Gospels. That's what that's that's the two different persons is Jesus is not God. Jesus is a human. Uh, God is spirit. God has always existed. And when Jesus is praying, Jesus is praying to God. And another word for God would be the father. Or another word for God would be God is spirit or God is the Holy Spirit or God is the creator of the universe. You know, there's many different names. God is um, Elohim. Uh, God is uh, El Shaddai. Uh, there's many names or, or terms for God, but, but there's only one God, and Jesus is not God. Um, I certainly don't believe that Jesus is God the Father. I believe that Jesus is the Son of the Father, Second John 3. I don't believe he's God the Father. So I will agree with you if that's what you meant. You said an awful lot. You made multiple points and I, I tend to follow one point at a time. So okay. I would agree yeah, with I, you. No, that, I don't think that I would agree with I, you. I don't think that I don't think the Trinitarians believe that Jesus is the father. No, I never said that. I'm agreeing with you. Jesus is not the father. According to Second right. John 3, he's the son of the father. He's not the father. Right. right. People that believe that Jesus is the father 
that would be an example of oneness Pentecostalism or uh, modalism. You've gone quiet again. You're sp I can hear you, you. You perhaps moved away from the phone, or how about now? Uh, you're fine. You're 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 fine. Now. Okay, I I just figured it out. I put I put my pinky finger over the little mic. That's what I did wrong. Ah ah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. What would the Bible have to say to convince you that Jesus Christ, who is the Son, not the Father? has two natures he's he both shares his father's nature his being his essence his substance but he also has a human nature how would the bible have to read to to convince you of that well um it could just say that uh that would convince me uh but the idea of jesus having two natures uh took uh f over four centuries to develop by the church it is known as the hypostatic union, um, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. All theology and has taken all theology has taken many centuries to develop, including modalism correct. and Unitarianism and Trinitarianism. So, uh, you know, well, if you live in a greenhouse, don't throw stones, because that argument can be used. I'm, against, not, I'm not throwing stones at all. I'm answering your question yeah, about the, but that. The that argument can be used against your own position because every theological position has developed over time. I disagree. The Unitarian position was taught by Paul. Well, that's that's what everyone says. You speak to a modalist. Paul was a modalist. He taught what we teach in the oneness. You, you speak yeah, to. Yeah, that's not true. I know it's not, right, true. not true. I know it's. I, I know it's. I know it's not true, but it's kind of naive to think that the Apostle Paul um, taught exactly what you know some local pastor teaches in his church or building or hall or whatever it's called. The fact is, all theology has developed over time: Unitarian theology, okay, well, Trinitarian theology, okay, so modalist we'll, theology, okay, so I'll just stick with all your, theology. I'll just stick with your question. I'll, right. I'll just stick with your question. What, what would the Bible have to say in order for me to hold to the doctrine of the hypostatic union in that Jesus is fully God and fully man? Well, what the Bible would have to say is what is delineated at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, because the Council of Chalcedon defined the hypostatic union uh, and, and, and defined that Jesus has two natures that Jesus is fully God and fully man um, that would be something that the Bible could say but it doesn't well the Bible doesn't doesn't follow the creeds hopefully a creed if it's a, a good creed will follow the Bible but the Bible comes before all of the creeds the creeds of the modalists the Arians the Trinitarians are after the Bible not before the Bible what would the Bible have to say to convince you that maybe your position is wrong? The Bible could say that Jesus is God, quote and end quote. Jesus is God. Uh, Jesus could say himself, I am God. <laughs> uh, Paul could say, God is manifest in three co-equal, co-eternal persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That would convince me. Um, any of the apostles, any of the disciples could have said that God is one being made up of three persons. That would convince me. I, I'm not asking you about the Trinity. I, I'm asking you, what would convince you in some way that you're wrong? How, how would the Bible have to read to to, to sort of get you to change? Uh, would, you, would you be willing to change if, if, if the Bible were to correct you? Well, those would be examples of showing me that I'm wrong. Okay. Those, those, um, are, those examples that I gave. Jesus never spoke. That was, that was. Right. Jesus never spoke English, so he would not stand up and say, I am God, because he didn't speak English. He spoke Aramaic, which is translated in the Bible into, into Greek. Agreed? Okay. Yeah. So, well, I think he spoke Greek. I think he, I think he spoke the common language of Koine Greek in the Gospels. Well, the Bible is written in Koine Greek, but to the Jewish crowd, he would have spoken in 
probably Aramaic, which was the language of the probably. time for the common for probably, the common people. Yes. Very and probably to the masses, and probably to the masses, he would have spoke Greek. But many of the masses didn't speak Greek in that area. They spoke Aramaic. Okay, that's true. I know. Yeah. Um, so in those languages, Jesus could have said, "Ego uh, imai uh, theos" in the Greek. He could have said, "I am God," or in the Hebrew, he could have said, um, uh, "I." What's the Hebrew for "I am"? Ego um, imi. He could have said, oh, oh, the Hebrew, said "I am sorry. Yahweh." He could have said, "Yahweh, I am Yahweh." Sorry, but he didn't. Um. Jesus didn't speak English, so he, we don't find him using the English language. Agreed? I'm referring to Hebrew and Greek. Yeah, I know that. But if Jesus were to stand up and to claim to be deity, to claim that he's Yahweh, surely he'd do so in the culture, in the context of the culture of the day, of the time. He wouldn't be speaking using terms in our culture that we're familiar with in the 21st century American or English culture you know you speak yeah, to, you speak to someone today and they will say Jesus has to say I am God and if he doesn't use those exact words in English he ain't God okay that's ridiculous because you have to understand that's not my position I, I, I'm not saying it is but I'm just saying you have oh, to understand okay. Jesus in, in the culture of the day yeah I agree with you I agree with you that, that he could have he could he would have done that and could have done that. I agree with yeah. you. Um, we would we agree that Jesus has a human nature. We don't need to prove that. We agree that he has a human. Yes. Okay. Yes, he is a man. So yes. the, the question is Jesus's divine nature, which I would be quite passionate in. I would believe that Jesus, in the culture of the day, does apply divine titles and divine attributes to himself. I agree with that. Um, I think we need to define the, the word divine. He claims that he's that of okay. the same nature as his father. He he claims he claims to be he claims to be equal to his father. Jesus never claims to be equal with his father. He he claims that his father is greater than he is. Um, all right, let's deal with that verse first of all. John fourteen twenty eight. Okay. Um. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. The, the word there for greater is mesion. Interestingly, it's the same Greek word that's used in verse 12, John 14, 12. Uh, many years ago, I used to attend a Pentecostal church. A pretty extreme Pentecostal church, and they believed that they were going to outdo Jesus and do greater miracles than Jesus because in John fourteen twelve they misapplied the Bible to say that. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. So the word there is greater, it's mesion. As a former Pentecostal who would now have um, severe res reservations about what I was taught a, a great many years ago, um, the word here, mesion, means position, rank. It means that they're going to do greater, they're not going to outdo Jesus and do better miracles than Jesus. But there are millions of Christians um, here, uh, and it's simply saying that they're going to do more works for God than Jesus did because Jesus was one 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 person but there's millions of That's Christians right. today so the, the word mesion means rank and that's that's the meaning at John fourteen twenty eight. It's the same Greek word. My father is greater than I. It's simply saying that during his earthly um, time on this earth when he took on a human nature and he was positionally uh, lower than the father that's philippians chapter 2 as i'm sure you're aware, aware of the father has yes. a higher a higher rank a higher position than him now if jesus wished to say that the father is better than me better in nature 
he would have used a different Greek word, which he uses at Matthew, I think it's Matthew 12. Plyon. I agree. I agree that rank is the is what he's saying. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So let me let me just prove this from Matthew twelve. Uh, it talks about Jonah being three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, and then it says in verse forty one, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Now that's not Mesion. This is Plyon four one one nine. It's a different <laughs> Greek word that means better than. You compare Jesus to Jonah. And when Jesus says a greater than Jonah is here, plion means better than, better in nature. And then in verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with his generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here, plion again. So plion means better in nature. And here Jesus uses that to say he's better than Jonah uh, and he's better than Solomon. But mesion simply means rank. So Jesus is, is not denying his divinity when he says, my father is greater than I. It's simply re referring to his time here on earth. The position, he's not stating his divinity either. He's not stating, I agree, he's not stating his divinity here. But you don't <laughs> read every single verse of the Bible and then Jesus says, oh, by the way, and I am God. And then you read the next verse and Jesus says, oh, by the way, I am God. We don't find that throughout the whole Bible. There are some verses that we don't need to discuss because we both agree Jesus has a human nature. I'm asking you, how would the Bible have to read what would convince you that Jesus shares the same nature as his father and in his deity he's equal to the father? Or would you want me to, sh to share a verse with you? There are a couple of verses. Well, I there are no verses that say it. Uh, for example, Philippians 2 does well, not say that. Could I... Uh, you had your verse. Repeat that, repeat you had that over you, and over excuse and me, over. But excuse me. Philippians two doesn't say that. Titus two thirteen excuse doesn't me, say that. Excuse me. I like uh, to be hey, fair. Go ahead, go ahead. Excuse me. Show me. Excuse me. I like to be fair. Now you raised John fourteen twenty eight, and I reply to that. Would you like to reply to what I've said in John fourteen twenty eight, and then it's my turn to raise a verse. Not you don't raise all the verses, and I have to respond. Let's do this fairly. I'm doing it fairly. I'm, I'm responding to what you brought up earlier was uh, that Jesus is co-equal with the Father. And my point is, no, Jesus never said that he was co-equal with the Father. Well, you, you've offered no scripture for that. I yet. haven't used the phrase co-equal with the Father because to do that, you would have to define what you mean by co-equal co with the Father. You've introduced the concept of co-equal with the Father. Now, I have addressed John fourteen twenty-eight. If you have nothing more to say on that verse, can I raise a verse? Sure. Yeah. Uh, John 10, 30. I and my father are one. Now, in Jewish thought, it, it, we do the same in our culture. If, if you met President Biden, whether you l like the Democrats or the Republicans, if you met President Biden out of politeness for his high status as your president, you would say President Biden and me or President Biden and myself. And if I met King Charles, I would say King Charles and, and, and myself. We put the other person's name first out of politeness and good manners, especially if they have a high status, if they're a king or a president. Now, in Jewish thought, when you refer to God, you always put God's name before your name because he had a higher status. Here in John ten thirty, Jesus breaks that rule. He puts his name before father which in Jewish thought imp implies that Jesus is saying he's equal to the Father. I and my Father, the verb is esmen, we are, and then you have the neuter word for one, which many Trinitarians, I think, mistakenly assume this is an appeal to deity through the use of the word one. It's not, because it's the neuter word for one, it just means one in agreement. But I bring you back to the, to the statement, Agreed. Jesus puts his name I before father to imply equality with the father in the next verse then the Jews took up stones to stone him Jews didn't go around just deciding to stone people that was a sin that would be murder It'd be breaking one of the ten commandments you stone people for blasphemy so in Jewish thought in the in the first century if you said I and my father or I and God 
well, the I and Yahweh, that's blasphemy according to the Jews. So Jesus, in the Jewish culture of the first century, John 10, 30, is applying deity to himself. He's saying that he's equal to the Father. You just said that he's not doing that uh, two sentences ago. I did and not. Then your last sentence was that, is that he is doing that. Sorry, now you've totally confused me. Let me let me let let me start over from scratch. It is it is late. It's nearly it's nearly okay. midnight here in the UK. You said you said it's not claiming deity three sentences ago, and then your last sentence was that he is claiming deity. He's claiming equality with the Father. He's not saying I am the Father, because the verb is first person plural. I and my Father, Esmen, we are, and the word for one is hen. Is the neuter word for one, meaning one in agreement. You can't be one in agreement plural with yourself. So Jesus is not saying he's the father. He puts himself before the father to imply equality with the father. If I didn't make that point very clear, I am tired. It's been a long day. Perhaps I slipped up and made a mistake for which I apologize if that's the case. It's got nothing to do with equality with the father. It's got to do with unity with the father. And you correctly pointed that out earlier. It's about unity. It's about being one, uh, having, having uh, about them being like minded or having unity of purpose. Yes, certainly the word one, the neuter use of one, hen. Hears is masculine yes. word for one. Mia is feminine. Hen is neuter. So the neuter use of the word one, it's used in John, John 17 of the apostles that they may be one with us. John 17, I think 21 or 22. Yeah. I, I would certainly agree with you there, but you've missed the point. Jesus doesn't say my father and I. He puts his name before the father, which in the Jewish context of the first century means Jesus is claiming equality with the father. I don't care what you think. I don't care what Trinitarians think. I don't care what Unitarians think. In the Jewish first century culture, when you said I and my father or I and Yahweh, or they would really say Hashem because they didn't utter the name of God. If you said I and Hashem or I and my father, that's an appeal to equality with the father. That's why in the next verse, then the Jews took up stones to stone him because they knew full well he was claiming equality with the father in that statement. Now, you might say I live in Ohio in the year 2024 and it's not part of my American culture and I get it. But if you go back to the first century, this is first century culture. This is how first century Jews thought. So it's, it's irrelevant what American people in the 21st century think. It's irrelevant what Jehovah's Witnesses think. It's irrelevant what, you know, people who go to Trinitarian churches or Unitarian churches or Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Halls think. The only thing that's important is what do first century Jews think. And in first century Jewish culture, this was a claim to deity. Well, I uh, didn't miss your point at all. I heard it all four times you made it and understood it all four times you made it. And what I have done is disagreed with it. You pretending that I misunderstood it is being disingenuous. Why in verse 31 the Jews try to stone him? That's murder. Why, why would the Jews listen to Jesus say, I and my father are one? And then they want to break That's one great. of the Ten Commandments and murder him. That is an outstanding question. Are you ready for my answer? Yep. Okay. Jesus repeats multiple times all throughout the Gospels that these Jews, these were the Pharisees. Right? Do you agree with that? They were the Pharisees that he's talking to. Yes, no, maybe. Um... I'm just looking at the context the of the Pharisees. chapter. I, I don't know if that's the particular context in, in John chapter okay. 10. Well, but, okay, well, this is, he, this, this is the Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees, and Jesus repeats multiple times all throughout the Gospels, pointing out that the Pharisees were liars and hypocrites and vipers and of their father, the devil. In John ten thirty three, the Pharisees lie 
and they misquote what Jesus said in John 10, 30. Then, in John 10, 34 through 38, Jesus is admonishing the Jews' error. You are holding to the Jews' error. Uh, how? You are quite correct that what you're laying out is what the Jews were saying. You are spot on correct. The problem is that they were liars. And Jesus admonishes these liars in John 10, 34, 35, 36. Yes, he quotes Psalm, Psalm 80, 82, 6. So you think you're gods, do you? Ha, 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 ha. You will die like men, you unjust judges. Psalm, Psalm 82, 6 and, 6 and 7. Right. Right. Because right. Jesus is saying the only reason for him to say that, the only reason for him to point that out, is he's saying, no, I'm not claiming to be God. I'm claiming to be the Son he, of God. Yes, the Son of God is an affirmation of deity. False. Okay. Adam is called Adam is called son of God. Angels are called sons of God. Yes. Uh, believers are called sons of God or children yes. of God. Yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. But when Jesus uses know, the right. term the son of God, he's using it in the messianic sense that he is the promised messiah. Yes, that's correct, but so not he's God. not saying he's, he's not saying he's, he's very meaning of the word Messiah. Jesus, shows, Jesus is not, not Jesus is not saying that he is a created son of God in the same sense as Adam. Adam being a son of God is in a totally different sense to Jesus being the son of God, because only Jesus is monogenes weos, the only begotten son of God, or as the NIV reads, the one and only son. Correct, because he was born of a, of a virgin. He's the only human that was, that was conceived that came into being through a woman. Through, so he is unique. That's what monogenes means. It means unique. But um, I think it I'm means that he's your, unique because he's the only one who shares his father's nature. Son of God means God. Son I, of God doesn't mean God anywhere in the entire Bible. Je Jesus is not the father. Okay. Jesus is not no, God the father. I'm not saying, saying why Jesus is God the that? father. That's modalism. So Why I, would you keep repeating that? You and I... Neither, neither you nor I believe that Jesus is the Father. Okay. What, what would the Bible? How would the Bible have? What would the Bible have to say to you, to convince you that Jesus shares his Father's nature and that he is Yahweh, Yahweh God? He's not the Father, but he shares the Father's nature eternally. How would the Bible have to read to convince you of that? I already answered that. Well, could you fill me in again? Sure, I'd be more than happy to repeat it again. Uh, the Bible would have to say that Jesus is equal with the Father. It would have to say that Jesus is God. It would have to say that Jesus is just, equal Just give to me, God. if you make multiple points, you honestly anyone. lose me. You need to make one point, and, and I can respond to one point. You said equal. Jesus would have to say he's equal to the Father. Is that what you said? Yeah, and it would have to say that Jesus is God. And it doesn't say that Jesus is God. It doesn't anywhere. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation says nothing about Jesus being God. What do you want to deal with? Jesus being God or equal? Because it's best to deal with one okay, thing at a time. It, could you Jesus let me finish my sentence? It's, it's, it's confusing if you cut, cut, cut me off. I was going to go that Jesus says he's equal with the Father. Or rather, no, that's not. the testimony of John. No, he does not. John five eighteen to 23. May I read it? Sure. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he had not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he... Could I please... I asked you if I could read the passage. Would you let me read the passage, please? I didn't say a word. Okay. Uh, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. 
For whatever he does, the son does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the son, for as the father, sorry, it's, it's late. My eyes are, I'm in my sixties. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life, that's zoe, not bios in, in the Greek, to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. This is a key verse, verse 23, that all should honour the son just as they honour the father. He who does not honour the son does not honour the father who sent him. Now, looking at the passage, it, it says that he made himself equal with God in verse 18. But said that God was his father, which in the Jewish context of the day, he's not a father or our father. He's his father making himself equal with God. In verse 19, the son doesn't act independently of the father. He only does what he sees the father doing in verse 19. But in 20, in verse 20, the father loves the son and shows him all things. So if the father, if, if, if the son can't act independently of the father, he always acts with the father and he does what the father shows him. But in verse 20, the father shows him all things. Then surely that would mean that the son can do everything that the father can do. He's in no ways less than the father. Um, the father raises the dead and gives life to them, Zoe. The son does the same. And the son judges everyone at the final judgment, which scripture repeatedly says it's going to be God who's going to judge us at the final judgment. And verse 23 is significant that we're to honour the son just as we're honour, honouring the father. Thank you. Jesus is clearly disagreeing with the Pharisees and pointing out their error once again. You are correct about what the Pharisees said. You're spot on correct, 100%. You're quoting the Pharisees who said, you, Jesus, are claiming to be equal with God. The Pharisees were liars and hypocrites and vipers and of their father, the devil. The Pharisees were lying. You keep quoting the Pharisees for help with your doctrine. Mm. But, Sir, but I'm Jesus not, I'm trying actually... To be polite. Don't interrupt me. Don't interrupt me. Is that clear? You are quoting the Pharisees. Jesus then responds to them when they pretended that Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. He wasn't. Jesus then shows that he's not equal to God. <laughs> Jesus clearly says, and you just read it, that I can do nothing of my own of myself. He doesn't say that. I, I can't, he I, does not I say do that. He doesn't say that. He justifies <laughs> verse 18 and verse 19 and 20. The, the Pharisees <laughs> said he was making himself equal. The Pharisees said that God was his father and he's making himself equal with God. In verse 18. In verse 19, he's justifying himself. He says the son does nothing of himself. The son doesn't act as an independent deity. He's not an independent God who acts independently as a separate deity, a separate spirit, a separate divinity to the Father and the Holy Spirit. But he does exactly what he sees his father doing in verse 19. In verse 20, the father shows him all things. So if the father shows him all things in verse 20 and in verse 19, the son doesn't act independently of the father. He only does what he sees the father doing. But in verse 20, the father shows him all things. Then he's justifying himself to his critics, the Pharisees, in proving that he is equal to his father. And then the father raises the dead. The son gives life to those who are raised from the dead. That's something that only Yahweh God can do in verse 21. In verse 22, the father judges no one and has committed all judgment to the son. Well, a basic elementary reading of the scriptures will tell us that it is God who raises the dead and who judges the dead. And that's why in verse 23, the summation of this is that we're to honour the son just as we honour the father. And I don't think you're doing that, sir. I think you believe that the father um, 
the, the father and the son don't share the same nature. I think you believe the father is the deity and the son is something less than deity. Certainly the son has a human nature. I would agree with you there. But the son also shares his father's nature. And Jesus justifies himself to his critics in verse 19 to 23. Well, if Jesus is fully God, then he wouldn't need to look to the Father, uh, and he and he wouldn't need to be given that power. Um, uh, a elementary reading of Scripture. You shows misunderstand us that Jesus the Bible's was view of Christ. You you don't know. You don't stop understand. Please stop interrupting. Please stop interrupting. You don't. Me, you don't understand. You're going to you, finish my sentence. Please stop interrupting me, sir. I'm going to finish my sentence. An elementary reading of Scripture shows us that Jesus was given all authority. Jesus was given that power. Jesus cannot do it of himself. That That's what I said. That proves that he's not fully God. That is proof of it. So all you're doing is trying to prove the Trinity with the Trinity. No, I'm not. I'm not even referring to the Trinity at all. Yes, you are. You are, you are repeating the Trinity doctrine. No, what I'm doing is showing you that in, in John 5, Jesus must share his father's nature because he is he equal to the father and he justifies the Pharisees' criticism. The Pharisees were criticizing him when they said you're equal to God. And he justifies that in verse 19 and verse 21. Because he can only do what he sees the Father doing in verse 19. And in verse 20, the Father shows him all things. Which means that Jesus can do anything that he sees the Father doing. Secondly, at Philippians chapter 2, it, Jesus existed in the morphe, in the form of God. You can't exist temporarily in God's form. God is eternal. So if you exist in the form of God, you eternally exist in the form of God. Now, whilst he did not forsake his deity, that's a heresy known as kenosis. So he remained as deity. Nevertheless, he humbled himself when he took on a body of flesh. When he took on a human nature just over 2000 years ago. So Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form, morphe of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So there's another reference that the son is equal to the father, which you you denied, sir. Then we have the humbling event, but made himself of no reputation. That's not by forsaking his deity, as Benny Hinn and some of these Pentecostal TV preachers claim. OK, he did it by taking the form of a servant, i.e. taking on a human nature and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death on the cross. So for 33 years, he lived in this humble state. Then God highly exalted him back to the position that he had before. That's the that's in verse nine. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And I think you're also alluding to Matthew 28. I think it was 18. Um, all authority in heaven and earth has been past tense given to me. Um, I think that was the verse that you were alluding to. So I certainly agree that Jesus um, took on a human nature and was in, was in a humble state on, on this earth. The father has a higher rank than the son. Um, during his um, um, time on this earth, uh, I don't deny that. Going going back, what about the fact that Jesus, Jesus is the creator, but we read that Yahweh God alone is the creator. Yahweh God creates all alone and by myself, Isaiah 44, 24. I mean, even, even the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God, I know it's Elohim, not, not Yahweh there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, there's no hint in the Bible that in the beginning, God plus the angels plus this plus Tom, Dick and Harry created the heavens and the earth. The Bible is consistent in saying that God is the creator. When we come to the New Testament, we find several, several cases, surely, 
where the father creates through the son. The, the father's the source of the creation, but he creates through the son. There's a distinction between them. How would you deal with the fact that Jesus is creator? Wouldn't this mean that, that he is Yahweh God? Of course not. Jesus is the creator of the new creation. What Paul is talking about in Colossians chapter 1, for example, is our one hope. Uh, that's verse 5. Um, and the inheritance of the saints, that's verse 12. It's about the resurrection. Paul is talking about the new creation or the resurrection. Uh, and Jesus is the creator of the new creation. All oh, things are made on. new through Christ Jesus. Oh, Once come he on, came, that's ridiculous. Uh, Paul is not talking about the creation from back in Genesis. Oh, come on, this absolutely talking, ridiculous. You're he's not talking a, about Jesus being... Yeah. You're not, a, speak, you're not a fan. I'm going to hang up on you if you don't shut up. You're, I'm going to hang up on you if you don't shut up. You're I not a you fan of Sir Anthony Buzzard, straight. aren't you? You're not a fan of Sir Anthony. I think you speak for five minutes straight, boy. All right, finish there then. Bye-bye. Um, I didn't really want to go down this route and discuss the arguments that he was about to bring out because it would have taken a full hour to go through all the scriptures, at least an hour. And it had gone past midnight, and this is such an utterly ridiculous argument, it's just not worthy of consideration. Basically, what he was going to say was that all the passages that I would go to to show that Jesus Christ is the creator actually apply to the new creation. Now, that I presume to him, different people would put the new, new creation usually at Christ's return... Um, some people would say it has already happened. I believe the Jehovah's Witnesses say that in some sense the new creation started in 1914. Uh, but to apply every single passage that talks about Jesus Christ being the creator and saying this applies to the new creation, which we obviously are not in yet, because in the new creation, there's going to be no death. We're going to be given new, um, we will be given restored bodies. I was going to say new bodies. It's past midnight and I'm rather tired. Um, so, for instance, let me give an example. Philip, uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one. Um, we read in verse eight, but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So this is the father speaking to the son. And then in verse 10, uh, quoting Psalm uh, I think it's uh, 102, verse 25 to 27. The father speaking, you, Lord, speaking to the son, because that's the context in verse 8, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. Well, he's going to say this is the new creation. This isn't the Genesis creation. And the heavens are the work of your hands. That's the new heavens and the new earth in the new creation. It's not referring to the Genesis creation. Why? Because he doesn't want it to. So he can he can mould his theology. Um, it's just it's so stupid, and I came across this when I talked about this with Sir Anthony Buzzard about fifteen years ago, who's a Unitarian professor. They will perish, but you remain. Now, hold on, they will perish. If that's the new creation, how can the new creation perish? Obviously, it's referring to the Genesis creation. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. That's the Genesis creation. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They, that's the Genesis creation, will perish. But you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Well, will, will the new creation grow old like a garment? No. The Genesis creation will, will grow old and will be restored. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. OK, that's the Genesis creation, which is going to be restored. But but you are the same and your years will not fail. So what what he was about to do was to go into a hugely long winded argument, which I'm familiar with and say anything I bring up. That's the Genesis. That's the Genesis creation. Um, it's sorry, it's not the Genesis creation. I'm tired. That's the new creation. Uh, absolutely ridiculous. So in Colossians one. Um, he, that's the son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Okay. For by him, all things were created. 
that are in heavens and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. It seems to apply the Genesis creation. It is a past tense, isn't it? For by him all things were created, past tense. Paul's writing about AD 60. Wouldn't this be a past tense because it's referring to the Genesis creation? Oh no, he's going to say this This refers to the new creation. So it's it's an argument that's so stupid, it's not really um, worthy of discussion. And uh, it just gets my blood pressure higher. So uh, I, I just I just didn't want to go down that route.